We begin with the very latest on the coronavirus. What doctors know right now, including the discovery of a new variant of the virus that could make its way to the U.S. A mutation of the virus has spread from animals to humans in Denmark. The country now forced to euthanize nearly 20 million minks. Officials there say the strain showed less sensitivity to antibodies. And now other countries in Europe culling their mink populations. A recent study of more than 5,000 people with coronavirus in Houston discovered genetic mutations that make the virus more contagious. Doctors described it as a spike in the part of the protein that pries open our cells so that the disease can enter. With me now is Dr. Charles Cairns. Dr. Cairns is the dean of Drexel University College of Medicine. Doctor, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to be here, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Okay, first of all, help us understand this threat of a new strain or a mutation of the virus. Explain that. Well, we know that viruses mutate. In other words, they change uh, their configuration a little bit. The big question being raised by recent studies are do these changes and the COVID-19 virus change the way it infects people and how severely people are infected and manifest complications. So we know the virus changes, uh, but these latest reports suggest we really need to better understand how it increases infectivity and how it creates worsening disease. We actually get to see a lot of what's happening earlier in the, earlier in the year too, with what's happening in Europe, and then what does that mean for us? Because we can sort of see it coming, right? What have we learned from what's happening there? What we've learned is clearly uh, we're not done with this pandemic, that the virus is as contagious as it's always been. Frankly, there's some reports to suggest it may be more contagious, that clearly it's causing uh, disease, that we still have this wide variation in individual responses to the infection. Some people show no symptoms. Many people show severe symptoms, and unfortunately, far too many people are still dying. So we're learning it's not gone away, and it's coming here, and cases will be increasing. Yeah. And now with these mutations, is it just like the flu? As we try to find a vaccine for the coronavirus, now are we going to have to find different variances of a vaccine with these different mutations? And, and some will be right on the head, and some will not be as effective as others, just like with the flu? Well, certainly it's a concern, and that most of the vaccines are being targeted of areas of the virus that are conserved. In other words, despite the changes that occur in the rest of the virus, these areas remain pretty much the same. So if we can target the vaccine to those areas, then we shouldn't be as concerned about other mutations. But frankly, Tracy, there are still major questions about how this virus infects people, how it impacts the immune system, how long does the immune response last? And frankly, why is there so much variation across individuals? So we have to look at both the risk of infection with these virus changes, as well as the risk for full recovery. Because what we're learning now is that the virus can have some pretty long lasting effects on people. And so we need to better understand that immune response and how the virus interacts with people to create it. And how the virus responds to antibodies, right? Depending on the mutations. Absolutely. In fact, understanding that antibody response, understanding the entire body's immune or defense system. We're now learning there's a key role for T cells, for example, in addition to the antibodies being generated. And we need to understand why it's so different across people, across populations, across ages. And we're certainly finding out around Philadelphia that certain populations including people of color, are disproportionately affected. We really need to understand this. So much to still learn. How far away do you think we are from a vaccine? Well, clearly we're in the late stages of vaccine trials. So vaccines go through this development phase, and this has been remarkably quick. Just to remind everyone, within a month of having this virus publicly announced as being in the populations, we were able to go ahead and sequence it. It's, it's RNA. Then we were able within three months to develop the first vaccine. And it has to be tested first in animals, then it has to be tested for safety in small numbers of people, then it needs to be tested in populations that'll be exposed to the virus. And so we're looking for that signal of both safety and most of the vaccines so far seem to be safe, but are they effective? And that's the ones we're waiting for. 
And we understand from some trials, like the Pfizer trial, that they're very close uh, to their first look at those data. Once a vaccine is, is approved, will you, will you be telling your friends, your neighbors, your family, it's safe and we can take it? Because you know we've heard from people who say, when it first comes out, I'm not, I'm not willing to do that. I've heard those same concerns, Tracy. I have confidence uh, in the approach that the FDA has taken to determine safety. I have confidence in the companies that have been developing that, these vaccines that they'll be responsible for that safety. And so while things have been accelerated, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, that safety's been uh, not first at hand. I do think that we're still talking about small numbers of people who have been studied. So even in the Pfizer trial, for example, about 30,000 people have been enrolled. They're looking for 32 confirmed infections. And for the vaccine to be deemed successful, 77% of those infections have to occur in the placebo group or the group that didn't get the active vaccine. So when you think about um, the populations around Philadelphia or the populations of our 300 million people in the United States or 7 billion people on the planet, we still have a long way to go in terms of understanding the impact across a wide range of people. But I would absolutely encourage people, especially those at high risk, elderly patients, people in healthcare settings, people with chronic conditions at risk to get the vaccine once it's approved. You've talked in the past about the importance of contact tracing and we're starting to see how people respond to the idea of tell us where you've been, tell us who you've been with and then it gets out that you are infected and that you've tested positive. Can you talk to us about the importance of contact tracing and, and balancing privacy but fear, fears that other people will know but really this is public health that we're that we're dealing with well we're all in this together tracy yeah. and you know contact tracing is part of that this virus is so infectious i think i've mentioned this before that we think this virus infects at least two and a half people uh, for each person infected some reports suggest that's as high as five influenza in contrast only infects about 1.5 people so this is more infectious than the flu 40% of the people who have this virus don't have any symptoms. So they don't know they're infected. And so we don't quite understand why that's the case, but it certainly has implications because they we know they can still spread the virus. And so we need to better understand who's been exposed. We all need to wear masks. We all need to practice social distancing. We don't know who's infected. The people infected don't know. And therefore, we really need to better understand who else may be exposed. And so when we do these contact tracings, it's really just to protect the most vulnerable in our society, but frankly, everyone at this point, given we're over 9 million cases in this country and nearing 250,000 deaths. Last time you were on our show, we asked you what keeps you up at night when it comes to the virus. You said how very contagious it is. I know you're learning more and more as we go, but what keeps you up at night now? I really want to better understand not just the risk of infection, but this risk of recovery. It's clear there are people who have long-term consequences of their infection with the COVID-19 virus. And I really want to better understand that because if it's something that's going to last a lifetime or even for a significant period of time, then we need to better understand and concentrate our efforts at both older but younger people, especially children and young adults. So that's what's keeping me up at night right now. I know you'll keep us posted on what you learn in, in all of your research. Dr. Charles Cairns, Dean of Drexel University College of Medicine, thanks so much. Thanks for being with us. Privileged to be here. Thank you, Tracy.